Hello, creatives. Welcome to Girl Gang Craft, the podcast. Um, super excited today for our guest. Um, I've been sort of getting rid of me reading everyone's uh, little bio, but since we have a copywriter as our guest on the podcast, I have to read her bio. It's a really a great example about how you guys can, um, you know, make your bio really represent who you are, what you do and, um, how you convey that message to the world. So we have Tarzan K on the podcast today. Tarzan K is a former copywriter for hire who specializes in emails that are fun to read and more addictive than Netflix. Her online courses teach how to write story-based copy and make consistent sales from a small email list without using fear or FOMO. Her company's mission is to make high integrity marketing the new status quo for online business. In a previous life, Tarzan was a music major and once did a three-year stint in law school in French. When T-Boss isn't writing emails, you'll find her taking midday dunks in the ice bath or playing Billy Joel's greatest hits on the piano. Tarzan and her family live in Ontario, Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Tarzan. Thanks for reading that. I was like, <laughs> what will this bio be? Because I update it periodically. And I know this year there are a couple of podcasts that I heard it read and I was like, Ooh, uh, I don't like that. <laughs> anyway, I realized I updated it and I was like patting myself on the back. Like, good job, Tarzan. Yeah. Like that's you. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. So music major, I mean, that's, you know, not scheduled to be talked about in our conversation, but you want to talk a little about music major in law school? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Like I did, I did know since I was so young that I was going to be a writer and that was going to be my vocation. Like I have homework assignments from like when I was in grade two. Um, so that was always the goal. But at some point I, you know, got sidetracked and decided maybe I would be a musician. And I went to music school, studied jazz piano, which was awesome. Um, but I realized that a, I didn't really have the level of talent that I thought I did because I come from a small town and I, you know, I went to a high school with like 500 kids. So it was easy to be the best. And then when I was at music school, I was like, oh, I'm not the best at all. And also I'm not the most dedicated. So I was trying to find a way to um, make money because I also was like internalizing my beliefs about what could be possible in a, like a creative profession and decided that nothing was possible. So then I went to law school and I was by three years into law school, I was so miserable. And I was like, well, these are not my people. I don't identify with these people. And these are, this is who are going to be my colleagues for the next, for my career. So it took me three years to figure out that it was not the best idea. And, uh, well, here we are. Eventually I came back to writing and copywriting and which I feel is incredibly creatively fulfilling. Even now, like I don't, uh, even now I am, you know, I'm the boss of the business. I have employees who do who work much harder than I do. Maybe not. I work pretty hard, but, um, I still hang on to that creative piece. I don't outsource much copywriting because it's just so like, that is, feels like it's part of my identity being a writer and actually doing that creative work. It's what I really love. So if I'm not doing that, why am I doing this? So, yeah. So why copywriting then? I was okay. So I dropped out of law school. I went to Australia and I was at some point looking for a job and I saw the job ads in the job ads, uh, like a part-time position for a copywriter. And I was like, well, that has writer in it. That sounds like something I would enjoy. And by some miracle, I got the job, even though I had no experience. And um, the guy who hired me was a great guy. I wrote blogs and social media updates. I didn't actually enjoy it that much, mostly because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't see it actually being very profitable for the company. Like we never had any engagement. It all felt very like canned, but 
I don't know. I, I also was like, oh, I'm getting paid to write. Like, this is amazing. And um, didn't even occur to me how much better it was going to get. Um, so then when I came back to Canada, they kept me on as a freelancer and I just, um, was like, oh, okay. So this, I could be a freelancer or maybe that could be what I do. And I sort of dabbled in freelancing for a few years. I never, you know, I didn't have like a mortgage or children or anything like that. So I was like making enough money to get by, which was not very much. And I didn't have much of a career, but when my, finally, then I did have a child. And when my child was one year old, I was like, okay, now I actually need to seriously make money. And my partner really wanted to stay home with our son. So I became a full-time business owner and was like, okay, I'll, now I have to make it happen. And I rented an office and I would go there every day and like freaking figure it out. And here we are. This is, so, that was about six years ago. Okay. So who were you writing for initially then? I was, an, okay. In my freelance days, I was like literally would apply for anything and write for whoever would have me. And that didn't go so well. It didn't, wasn't especially profitable and I didn't have much expertise. Um, when I started my business, I immediately started taking online courses, which have been enormously helpful for my career. Like, wow, that was, that was like the missing piece. I can't believe I didn't think to like educate myself. Like when I look back on all the layers of privilege that I was not even aware of that I was like, and I'm a copywriter, pay me $50 an hour. I like, where did I even get the, the, um, I don't know. Where did I find the courage to do that? Or why did I even think I was qualified? Anyway, such is, such are the things you do when you're 25 or however old I was. It was more like 30, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, started taking courses. And as I started taking courses and learning about copywriting, I also was learning and observing this industry of online business. And, um, I started writing, I started specializing in email because I discovered that I did have a lot of natural talent and combined with the courses that I was taking and everything I was learning about the, about marketing that way, I started to get really good at it. And, it attracted lots of clients in that, in the digital course space. And I never lacked for clients. And eventually I was like, okay, all these people are hiring me to write their sales copy because they don't have this skill. And it's a really key component. Like if you can't write sales copy and you're selling a information product, I mean, with services, you can kind of get away with it a little bit maybe with products a little bit with information products, you cannot, like you can't, I would argue that copywriting skills are important no matter what type of business you have. And I, I think any business owner would probably agree with that. Um, Can I you just define thought, what, um, uh, what did you say? What information product, well, an information for, product, like a course or, you know, some sort of PDF or like any sort of any sort of information that's packaged in a digital way, whether it's videos, audios, those sorts of things. Make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I was seeing so many people trying to um, build these businesses in the online course space and was like, well, wait, I have the skill. I should probably use this for myself. And that was when I began, I started the course based side of my business and it took a few years, took like probably two years to transition from being fully a service-based business to being fully, um, a digital product-based business. And so what does your business look like today? Uh, so right now I have pared down my business considerably. Um, I have two programs and our signature program is called email stars and it teaches email marketing. Um, it's for service-based businesses and digital course creators. And that one we open twice a year and it's live and it comes with like a ton of support. And that is our, that's our big thing. And, uh, we also have a something brand new, which is a copywriting program. It's called copy caboose. 
And we created, I created this program after almost going through a personal crisis of like seeing the destruction in the online business space and how much, um, how sales tactics are used and abused and how um, persuasion is often used to shut down critical thinking and cause people to buy things that they're not, um, that is actually not in their best interest. So I really wanted to stop doing those things, stop teaching people to do those things and give them a way to use, um, to use these sales strategies in a way that feels, that aligns with their own personal ethics. So that was the creation of Copy Caboose. Um, so those are our two big things. And I've done a lot over the years. I used to have a mastermind program that I no longer have because it's not something that I feel nourishes me personally. I love being a part of a mastermind, but running one I don't love. And I also used to do a lot of affiliate promotions, um, but that I also dropped because I um, just didn't feel in alignment. It felt like, and my subscribers also sometimes complained that they were just seeing too many offers. So I have dialed back my offers a lot and also sacrificed a ton of revenue cutting things out. But I sort of this year really turned a corner and started thinking more about like the company mission and how I can be a leader in this space and especially in terms of um, marketing that is um, like justice oriented. Okay. So I want to return back to the bro marketing FOMO anti-racist work in a second, mm -hmm. but I also think this idea of paring down is so interesting and it's something that I have watched you do and um do you want to talk about, um, how, so you, you've talked about how you were making a lot of revenue at one point and, um, you had some experience with psychedelics that helped you realize your purpose and helped you pare down things. And I would love to hear more about that. Yes. Oh my gosh. Have I been on a journey? <laughs> so, um, Okay. I feel like I gave away the punchline. Nope. I've told the story a lot. So <laughs> just pretend you don't know what I already said. And let's rewind to, it's roughly two years ago that I was at a place in my business where I had done so many, I just done so much marketing and used all the tactics. And I was really making good money and had like nearly hit the million dollar mark, which I really thought meant something. And I was like feeling a bit empty and I was feeling like I was not being present. I had this very persistent fear that I would look back on this time when my children are young, I have two children now, that I would look back on it and I wouldn't be able to remember it. And I felt like so consumed with my business and I felt like I was missing my life and I had all of our financial needs taken care of plus extra. And that felt really good. And all, but the, also the drive to make more was like, I didn't know why I would do that. And I also felt disconnected to any sense of purpose. And I went in to see my coach, her name's Kathleen O and I worked with her for 10 years. Um, and I said, she asked me, she was like, okay, what, what do you believe in? And I was like, huh? I don't know. And she lovingly said, you know, I work with a lot of like millionaires and billionaires and they're like, there's nothing at the top of this ladder you're climbing. There is more ladder. And you bought the lie of patriarchy, which is that when you get more, you'll be satisfied. And if you continue to get more, you'll feel more satisfied. And that was like such an enormous wake up call. Like that was the most, I didn't know it at the time, but that was the most, probably the most powerful coaching session I've ever had in my life. And I've had some really powerful coaching sessions. Like I work with great people. Um, and so it was shortly after that, that I started working with psychedelics 
And that like starting with, um, with a guided journey with my coach and, um, that just opened up so many whole new worlds for me. And I started to see something like I, in that first trip, I connected to my purpose and I saw that it is my work here to be a storyteller and to connect people through stories because our stories are how we get through the hard parts of life. And I also saw that I had been doing that and that I would develop that. And also that, that, that could play out in a lot of different ways. Like, um, that doesn't mean that didn't mean I had to let go of my whole business and like teach storytelling or write books or anything like that. Um, this was the beginning, like the very beginning. And I spent a lot of time unpacking the lessons of that journey and have continued to work with psychedelics. Like that was January, 2020. So let's say 18 months ago. And, um, I definitely treat the medicine like medicine and I take time to integrate the lessons. And I would say, I don't, I can't remember, like I could trace back every journey that I have done and tell you precisely like, this is what the lesson was and this is what I did after. And it's like been life-changing. I also have, um, my, I also microdose between journeys, which to me seems to like help me put all the puzzle pieces together that come through in the journey and a big, so there's like the individual lessons that I have gotten from any journey that I've done, but there's also just like anyone who's been following along in my business for the last eight, like since January, 2020 has been a witness to a profound shift in the way that I do business. And it didn't all happen at once. Like last year, I still had a lot of offers. I still used like all the marketing tactics I knew about. And I um, like slowly had to like come into like, what is my purpose? How is that playing out in my work? And um what do I need to change about my business in order to be fully living my mission? And that's like such high level work. And I, I am a business, so it, it doesn't like, I'm not a solopreneur who could like flip a switch overnight and be like, this is the business I have now. Like we have to, we have, I have salaries to pay and also a team whose opinion I have deep respect for. So we make decisions together. And honestly, like we're in a good place a year later, um, since, well, no, we're 18 months out from that. If we're, it depends where you start, right? Who knows? This journey has been going on forever, but it does feel like the last 18 months of my life have been incredibly important. And um, I think we're in a good place. Like we definitely have proven the model that you can do marketing in a different way and it can still be highly profitable. It can still um, provide like so much support for me as the owner, provide good jobs for people, we're not, we haven't totally cracked the code on achieving the same level of profitability, but also we sell a lot less and we're a lot, le we're a lot more, um, like we're a lot more intentional about the tactics that we use. So I still feel like such a beginner. I feel like my business is still very early stage and I will look back on this time and be like, ha ha ha. Oh, young Tarzan trying to figure <laughs> it all out. Like bless her. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. I still feel I have so far to go, but I also feel so much more connected to myself. I feel like I am in my body. I feel more connected to my family uh, and my friends. Um, it like this, journey that I've been on and these changes that I've made in my business have reverberated in all areas. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, that medicine seems very potent and it, uh, it's, I feel grateful to have witnessed your journey as well. Um, I think, you know, a lot of our community isn't maybe, at that, uh, revenue level that mm -hmm. you're talking about. But I think what's something that has been going on in our community 
and I also feel deeply is this burnout thing, Mm. this like doing too much, this, Mm. uh, hustle mentality, this hamster wheel, whatever offering all the programs every, every month offering a new program. Um, a lot of our community is makers. So they're doing all these events again, right? A lot of our community Mm. lost all their events, right. From COVID, um, lost maybe those wholesale models, um, because retail wasn't open. Um, and so it's interesting to think about the burnout and think about dropping things. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's two sort of sides to that coin, right? Dropping things when you have sort of the revenue built up and also dropping things when maybe that revenue is not there. Mm-hmm. And how do you sort of prioritize your, you know, your purpose, your family, mm-hmm. yourself, whatever is important to you. Um, it's scary. It's scary to drop things, especially when there's yeah. money attached to it. So how did you sort of start to like make those decisions about what to drop? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I think I first think I'm glad you brought this up. Cause I, I recognize like I have an enormous amount of privilege and that I, I have, um, enough money in the bank, like the business, not me personally, the business has enough money in the bank to take care of itself and, um, do these experiments. And it almost feels like I owe it to all those people who paid me that money, um, to freaking figure this out. So that is a privilege. I also think it's important to acknowledge, like when you are starting a business, like that is entrepreneurship. Like you have to wear a million hats and do a million different things. And it won't always be that way, but part of it is like, I mean, I, I could have said to you, like, I don't hustle. I've always worked four days a week, but the truth is like, you can hustle when you're not at your desk. Like I was so like, I just never stopped thinking about my business 24 seven. And that's what burned me out. Like, did I need to be thinking about it from five o'clock, like from 5 PM to the next morning when I went back to work, I probably didn't. And at the same time, like what also that level of obsession served the business, like it did. And I think it's important to know that there are seasons of being in business and right now I'm in such a good season. Like we worked our buns off this year to create so many, like create a whole new program, also revamp a lot of my existing program to make sure it was in alignment with our core values as a company. Um, we worked so hard and this summer I'm totally coasting. I'm enjoying having a lighter workload. I'm working fewer hours. Like it feels really good. Um, and there'll be another season where I work really hard. So I think that is important to acknowledge. First of all, if you're feeling burnt out, like you're in a season right now, but in general, um, I think the assumption of like, oh, I have to work this hard. I have to do all these, uh, like, cause I'm startup and I don't have much money. I have to create all these offers and be doing a thing every month. The assumption there is that the more offers you create, the more, sales you're going to get. And that may be true, but it also may not be true. Like I know, um, we, you know, with our two offers, like we probably should, like, we, we do talk about this. Like we need to diversify. We do need to have more offers. However, every time, like what, what I see happening, and this is fine. It's part of being in business is creating new offers to figure out what sells. And like, sometimes you feel like you're throwing shit at the wall and that's okay because you will see like, oh, this sticks and I'll go with that. So again, like we constantly coming back to being able to give ourselves grace with wherever we're at, what season we're in and you're trying to figure it out. And you may just land on, but when you land on something that people really bite well then don't go on and create the next thing. Like work with that, launch it again, sell it again, create more of that thing. Because I mean, this is especially true with digital products. There's, because there, there are just so many, um, you know, there's so many parts to building a sales funnel, actually, whatever you're selling services, products, digital, digital or physical, um, you know, a sales funnel has a lot of moving parts. And if you just slap something together every time, like it's, you're never going to be optimizing it. 
and you're never gonna like it's hard to grow beyond whatever those initial sales were that you made so that is something that we've really leaned into this year like just really focusing on the products that we have and giving them all of our attention um and then we'll move on to creating the next thing okay thank you for that um okay pivoting a little bit so you've talked about how you are sort of disrupting the marketing industry um with being anti bro marketing uh, anti-FOMO, anti-racist. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience? Um, how you realize that's something you want to do first of all, and, uh, what that looks like. Yeah. Okay. The first thing I feel like I need to make a disclaimer and say that, uh, there are a lot of experts in this area and I am not one of them. I am someone who is fumbling the ball constantly but I am at least trying to catch the ball. Uh, I'm not ignoring that someone's throwing a ball at me saying like, hey, pay attention to this problem. But um, I have, um, I like about two years ago had someone approach, it's sort of a story, maybe I'll tell the, I I don't think I'm gonna bother telling the story if that's okay. Somebody approached me, is that okay? (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) I'm like, some stories I'm like, let's just let this lie. Anyway, (laughs) someone uh, came to me and told me in a very direct way, um, this was September, 2019, that um, I had a problem. And it was after an event that I hosted and she was very specific about all the ways that my racism that I wasn't aware of showed up at that event and what that felt like for her as a brown woman. And, um, she like, bless this woman. I'll be so grateful to her for the rest of my life. Um, she was very concise and she wasn't, um, she wasn't even, I mean, she had every right to be emotional about it, but she, um, you know, took her time making an explanation of all the things that were problematic and, I read that email and my heart dropped out of my butt and I was like, oh fuck, I have a, this is a very serious problem that I like, it was like, uh, it's hard to know, um, to just all of the sudden, all at once, like see all these levels of, of unconscious bias that suddenly becomes conscious And to know that like, it's been there all along and I've been operating, um, I've been operating with all these biases and harming people and not knowing it. And also like, there's just so many feelings that came up like grief and anger. Like I did not choose to be indoctrinated in this way, but here we are, I am, and I benefit. Um, so that journey of, figuring out what does it mean to be anti-racist and what would that look like in my business started for me in September, 2019. And I was sort of coasting along in my anti-racism work and really, you know, making progress. And also every, all, every bit of progress felt like a million steps backwards. Um, but, and then last summer, like with, the murder of George Floyd and everybody sort of all waking up at once. That was like a really deep growth moment for me to watch the whole industry waking up and seeing like, oh, it's not just me. And look how it's playing out in all of these other businesses. Like this is everywhere all around me. And I I am like steeped in white supremacy in every moment that I spend in this online business scene and I don't want to be and that so I'm grateful for how much like all the voices who spoke up during that time and I learned so much more and it was around that time that I started to um see through the work of Kelly Deals her how much these marketing tactics fall heaviest on the most marginalized people in my audience and how I, because of my programming tend to assume that everyone has the same level of access that I do. 
and you know some beliefs that are very entrenched in the online marketing space is um oh, what is the word there's a really good word to describe this meritocracy um meaning if you put in everybody who puts in a certain amount of input will get the same output um and i had really been operating on that and you know thinking about everything as like a mindset issue if someone didn't get results and I started to back up and like, look at, okay, what is this industry? Like, why do people talk about these things like imposter syndrome and money blocks and all these things? And like, I started to see how all this like new agey language sort of paints over like real systemic issues. So that, um, that started me down a path of exploring what it would look like if like, what does it, what are the implications of using persuasion strategies? The persuasion strategies that I have been studying since the beginning of my career, like using scarcity, urgency, liking, um, authenticity, social proof, uh, or authority, pardon me, authority, social proof, all those things. Um, taking a closer look at what I had considered to be the standard way of doing business and seeing like, well, is this okay? Um, what does it like, what does it, what is my level of responsibility if I put countdown timers, a big red countdown timer and get somebody to make a $2,000 or in my case, I mean, email stars is $1,500. It's currently the most expensive thing we sell. Um, and I'm like force a decision on that. Like what, if that's not a good decision for that person. And honestly, so many people came out of the woodwork to tell me that they bought and they were kind. Like I have such an incredible list of email subscribers. They are, they teach me so many lessons. Like, wow, I'm grateful. Um, and a lot of people came out of the woodwork and were like, yeah, you're right, Tarzan. I love you. And also I bought this product from you because I saw this countdown timer or I wanted to get this bonus. And then I never opened it. Like I heard that a lot. And conversely, um, we get so much beautiful feedback from our launches. They feel different. People are grateful to not be pressured to buy. Um, they will say like, you know what? I, the timing isn't right for me, but I'm really looking forward to getting this program. And thank you so much for not making me feel bad about that. And I'm like, oh, that's what I've been doing for the last five years, like making people feel bad about themselves if they don't buy a product. And this needs to stop. And that is a, that is a, like, I want to be a part of that solution. So what are subtle ways that you have changed your actual languaging or format of these? Well, things? for one thing, we're much more intentional about countdown timers. We do use them. We, they're much smaller and we use countdown timers throughout the launch instead of just to create urgency at the end. So, you know, if, if we have a, if we're enrolling email stars and it's open for eight days, we will have a countdown timer right at the beginning. So you visit the page and you know that you have eight days to decide. We also took out all of our expiring bonuses. So you will never get an email. Well, you wouldn't have, I'm like nothing nothing is set in stone for me. Like I do what feels right based on what I know and what feels good in the moment that I do it. So this isn't to say these are the rules for everyone or that I will do this forever, but this felt good now in our last promotion. So we didn't do any expiring bonuses. Um, you could opt, like you could click a link. We do lots of really incredible things with email. And one of the fun things we did this year was like, if you want to see countdown timers, just hit this button. And then you would see countdown timers in all the future emails if you wanted to. Um, we also removed the markup on our payment plans. We don't do that. We have, we don't do that. Um, we offered an extended payment plan, a 12 month. We normally so your payment do. plan is the same price as this, if you exactly. buy it. Exactly. Yeah. So let's say, okay. Instead of normally we would have, um, $1,500 or six payments of 275, which works out to about, I don't know, 15 to 20% more. Um, now it's just like $1,500 or six payments of 250. So it's exactly the same. And we don't even offer incentives for people to pay in full. That again is something I don't, we, we might do again, but I just never want to like, then this is people told us this verbatim, like 
They felt like they were being punished. Like it's a poor tax, not being able to pay in full. They also don't get some special thing. So that felt really good with the new bonus strategy. Um, we have, um, we don't do charm pricing anymore. It's 1500. It's not 1497. There's just a lot of small tweaks that charm might pricing. even on I've never own. heard that charm pricing before Charm pricing. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's like so many small tweaks on their own that don't seem like much, but we really combed through our whole process. Um, any testimonials, which I have so many, and I had used to have them all over my website and sales pages from people that were like, I made $20,000 from one email. Like I have many versions of that testimonial. I do not publish them anymore. Like it's so misleading. So we removed them with like achievable outcomes that anyone can get. Like mm. a favorite is um, people saying like, someone replied to my email and said, it was the, I'm the favorite email they got all week, or this is the best thing in my inbox or like, even like, wow, have you been taking lessons from Tarzan? Like, um, that is like really writing beautiful mm -hmm. emails that get lots of replies and that, um, versus like high replies. versus yeah. like high revenue, because not everyone's going to have that same result. Well, yeah. And having high revenue, like someone who like, let's take this person who made $20,000, she or he or they probably, um, like probably has done many promotions before that. They're probably capitalizing on previous promotions and credibility that they have built. They probably have a decent sized email list. Like there's all these things that that person would have had to do to get that result. So like there, there's yeah. just like too much. I do, I haven't totally cut those out. Like there are some testimonials with, um, with numbers in them. However, I try and keep, like, I would never use that as a one liner. And, you know, some people do write in though, and they'll say like, I have 12,000 people on my email list. I had this number of people sign up to the webinar and I had this conversion rate on the, on the webinar, which resulted in this dollar figure like that. I feel good about sharing because there's so much more backstory and nobody's going to sign up to my program with no email list and no product thinking there's some magic trick where they can get $20,000 because there is no magic trick. Yeah, that's fascinating. Super interesting. Um, okay. Well, thank you for sharing all that too. I mean, I, I'm just sort of thinking about my own tactics as well. I mean, the charm pricing, I hadn't heard that before, but I, I've definitely used, I definitely use the, the seven, the seven, yeah. I think Jenna Kutcher once said that like the seven thing. And it really stuck with me for some reason. I mean, I love the seven. <laughs> I love the number seven. I want to, I want to do that. And actually yeah. that's new for us. Like we just did that with email stars and um, we'll probably do it with our other program, Copy Caboose, which opens in September. It's probably open right now while your listeners are listening. Um, so we'll probably change it from 497 to 500. Um, but, uh, you know, there's like, everybody gets to do their own research. And the thing about ethics is like, there's no Bible of ethics that says, do this, don't do that. Like, businesses are complex. Like once again, it is a privilege for me to not do the bonus thing. Like I, when you're an early, earlier stage than me, you know, you may need those early sales so that you can pay a designer, or put your money into Facebook ads. Like those, you actually may need to put a little bit more pressure on because I mean, even just in terms of like, your morale as a business owner, like it makes an enormous difference if you are making sales, like it's hard to follow through with a big promotion when nobody's buying. And when you don't have those incentives to buy early, like people do wait until the end. The last and day, always. <laughs> yeah, they always do. So, and, and, you know, I, like, I know you have a lot of, there's a lot of product based business owners listening. Like, I mean, it's okay. Like you can, I'm not saying you can't do limited time discounts or anything like that. Like you, what I think is most important is actually spending time looking at what you are doing with your marketing and like checking in, like, does this feel in alignment with my ethics? If you don't know what your ethics are, well, then that's something that needs to be looked at. 
um, and proceeding according to what feels right for your business. And nobody can just hand you that. Like that is deep work and it has to be looked at. Another, the other side of that is to listen to your customers. Like I, you know, if I had a nickel for like every complaint that I ever heard in my early days of business and wrote it off as people being bitchy or people having money mindset problems because they didn't want to use a certain sales tactic. Like um, now I just listen better. And the more I listen, the more I learn. And your subscribers will tell you like, it, or your customers will tell you if they don't like something. And when they go out of their way to tell you they don't like something you're doing and why, like listen to them. You may not agree and that's okay, but take the time to listen to them and check in and figure out, do I agree or do I not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to um, change gears a little bit and get a little bit more technical because I know a lot of small business owners are going to want your uh, sage advice for some upping their emails. Mm -hmm. But first off, what program do you use for your emails? We use active campaign. Okay. We have, we, I started out with ConvertKit and I loved ConvertKit and I still strongly recommend ConvertKit actually over active campaign. Um, I love active campaign. It can do so many wonderful things. Like I am like, we emails our thing. So we totally geek out on it and we like to do really interesting and fun things that, um, ConvertKit just probably could have done, but just would take a bit, a bit more work. Anyway, I love active campaign. It is a great software. However, the learning curve is quite steep and, um, convert kit is just such a powerful tool that I actually would recommend that before recommending active campaign. Also convert kit has better customer support. And why, what, what sort of tools like segmenting and what, what sort of tools are you talking about for convert kit specifically? Oh, like what can it do? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, even just keeping your customers organized based on what products they bought, what have they been through a welcome sequence? Have you promoted something? Did they click on it? Like our, an email service provider can give you so much information, which you can either choose to use, or you can just use that. Like also it doesn't have to, like for most people, what will make the biggest difference in their email marketing is actually just consistently showing up. Like it, it, it doesn't, like you can get one day you'll be ready to make it more complex than that. But if you're not there yet, that is step one is consistently like weekly or bi-weekly emailing your list and telling them, you know, sharing industry news, what you're all about. Do you have something for sale? Those sorts of things. Totally. We use Flowdesk and I know a lot of our listeners do because it's a very simple platform and it's very mm -hmm. affordable at $19 a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but some of these other programs have so many more capabilities that float us, you know, just is a startup as well. So they don't have all of these sort of things that you can geek out on, on segmenting mm -hmm. and unsubscribing from certain segments and not others. And mm -hmm. I mean, you said something about account, like hiding or, uh, the countdown, oh. Yes, like yes, so. yes. Most email service providers do, that's called conditional formatting. So when you show something to some subscribers and not others, that's pretty basic. But I do remember now ConvertKit only debuted that a bit later in their years. But I have a lot of students that use Flowdesk and love it. And most of what I teach in my program can be done in Flowdesk. Okay, cool. That's helpful. So, you know, what are a couple tips, um, you said showing up. So what are a couple tips for small businesses who are trying to grow their list and trying to, uh, let's say maybe make their list, uh, a habit, make their list. They actually something mm. they do, What is some advice about that. Okay. Well, I, I feel like I need to come clean and say, List building is a real struggle for me. It's a big struggle. And in fact, right now, lead generation is the number one biggest problem that I need to solve in my business. Um, so I'm not an expert. I run, I spend a lot of money on ads, growing my email list through Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, so 
the, but what has worked for me in the past growing my email list in terms of growing, um, having like qualified subscribers who stick with me in the long term, what's worked for me the most is speaking on stages and podcasts and teaching in small groups. And I think, I mean, for a service based business or even for your makers and product based businesses who are listening, um, that is basically you actually have a great opportunity to just because you're showing up in front of people all the time at trade shows, like get like build your email list that way and offer them something just like we offer free digital things like offer them something and it could be a digital thing it could be a physical thing I don't know it could be a button. Um, could be something cheap. Like I, if you consider like I pay $3 per lead at minimum and sometimes up to 10 through Facebook ads. So like, what are you willing to spend to acquire an email subscriber? Like 25 cents, like that's money well spent. Like a lot of every, every successful business owner I know would, would love to get a new email subscriber for 25 cents as like a dream scenario and makers you're crafty. So you can think of something <laughs> cool. Um, stickers are great. Stickers, stickers are another cheap one. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah, stickers probably cost two cents. So that's a great one. Um, and, uh, in terms of nurturing, like creating that habit, uh, creating the habit is the most important thing. And I would recommend putting it on a schedule, like, if for in my case, I, I email my list twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, Monday is my writing day. So I don't normally take very many appointments, usually none at all on Mondays. And um, I do my writing. And it I when I first started out, I had an hour blocked off in my calendar every Friday to write my email newsletter. So just carving out that time, like it's not going to happen on its own it can be hard. Like if you don't do a lot of writing to actually get that newsletter written can be a bit laborious. So like, you're not just going to suddenly think about it and feel like doing it. So let's just own that and, um, decide when are you writing it and when is it going out? That's the first thing. And in terms of the content, I think the most important thing I want people to know is, um, it gets a lot easier, the more experienced you get. So, um, like, don't worry too much if your emails are not amazing uh, in the beginning. Like nobody is, a, nobody rides a bike perfectly. Like the first time they get on the saddle, it's okay. Uh, you're not every email has to be spectacular. So creating like, and, and this comes back to creating the habit, like the more consistently you write them, the better you're going to get. And you can share things like what products you're working on. Like if you're a product-based business, I think it's really fun to see behind the scenes of what your shop looks like, or when you're making things to share like, you know, little how to's or, um, you know, share pictures, although don't use more than 40% images. Cause that can put you in a spam trap. Um, but, uh, you know, just share like what's happening in the industry. What are you up to? You don't always have to have a link or be telling them about an event or a show or something. You can just email them to email them and share your process or whatever you're working on. Um, so give yourself some permission to just sort of play with that and see what comes up. I love that. I mean, I think you sort of answered my next question a little bit, which is that I was going to go into is that your emails are so personal. You tell stories about your life. Today's email, not at the time of the re recording was about your photo shoot. Mm. Um, and just that story is so great. And so I think my question is, you know, someone who maybe has a brand that's not so, that's not so focused on themselves versus someone who has a personal brand? Like, how do you sort of make that distinction? Like for instance, um, Amanda from GGC is writing our emails. So it doesn't quite make sense for her to tell a personal story about my day. Maybe it makes sense for her to tell a personal story about her day or really sort of announce things that are happening in the company. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure yeah, what my question my, is. <laughs> my emails are like very narrative style and that's me like leaning into that, my storyteller side. Um, but that is not the best option for most people. Like we are wired for stories. So sharing stories is important and not all stories have to be told in the first person. Uh, Amanda could be telling like a company story 
um, could be telling a story about something that's going on behind the scenes. Like we, people love stories. Like we're all, we like, I mean, it's summer here, so I don't want to do this right now, but you know, in the winter, I basically just want to binge watch Netflix all day long, every day. I love stories. I want to know the end. I, I like, I like a good hook. So that, and any business can tell stories. Like they don't have to be first person stories. They can be stories of what's happening in the office. They can be stories about things that are happening in the industry. They can be a client story. Like some, I'm sure you have a million trade show stories from your students. Like those are great sharing. They probably come with great pictures. So, but that's just one type of email. Um, like a lot of, a lot of people write emails that are more about their products. That's uh, also a great, like, especially if you're a product-based business, like I, that product-based emails are so different. They have way more images. They often will feature like some sort of discount. Like if a product-based business link, like I don't want a product-based business to link me to a blog post. Like, no, show me your products. Like, tell me what I should buy this month. Like what's coming up for next month. Um, so my, like I am a personal brand and, um, at oftentimes I wish I wasn't because it means I'm a major bottleneck in my company, but I do, it does. It also means I get to do the thing I love to do, which is write and tell stories. And that's not most people's goal when it comes to email marketing. I think it's important to give yourself that permission. If it feels right to share things that are personal and, that you feel most passionate about, but that is just being clear. That is not a requirement for successful email marketing. Okay. That's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing that you have someone on your team that can write those emails for you. And for business owners who are in that position, like I would a hundred percent lean into that, hand it off to someone else. That person, like when I used to do this uh, for clients, I would just go and talk to that business owner and pull the stories out of them and then tell them in their name. So this is not that different. I love that. Okay. Well, Tarzan, this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It is. Yeah. Thank you for asking and giving me a platform to tell my stories. I tell them in my email newsletters two days a week and the best place to get on my email list is tarzank.com slash email. There are, if you're listening in September, we're sort of moving past the freebie model because I really want people to join my email list to get the emails. Like a freebie is fine, but if you want to be entertained by stories that are um, heartfelt and funny, um, there's a lot of that. And also just a lot of very raw and transparent behind the scenes of what it takes to have a business like mine. We will put that link in the show notes and also attach, uh, your Instagram. What is your Instagram handle? Just in case people Tarzan, are listening that way. My Instagram handle is Tarzan underscore K and I do stories uh, almost daily. And that is my preferred social platform. So if you DM my account, you actually will be talking to usually to me, sometimes to my team, but mostly me. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Tarzan. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.